Welcome back to this Elida Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. With me now are Professor David Awurawo, Professor of International Relations and Strategic Studies at the University of Lagos, and Professor Anthony Killer, Professor of Strategy and Development and Institute Director at the Commonwealth Institute of Advanced and Professional Studies, CIAPS. Gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining me on this live again. Um, we've had quite a number of uh, topics today. We've discussed OSACO elections with the head of elections of uh, Yaga Africa. We've discussed uh, uh, Paike Clark's uh, autobiography, uh, Brutally Frank, which will be presented at the Muslim Center publicly on uh, Tuesday. We've discussed inflation, now 27.33%, with Nigeria facing the threat of stagflation. And then we have breaking news about the situation in Plateau State, where the Court of Appeal has, uh, shall I say, deposed <laughs> the incumbent governor, Mutwang, and declared Goche of the All Progressive Congress as the uh, winner, on the grounds that the PDP had no structure in that election, and that uh, Governor Mutuan was, in fact, not a candidate. However, the matter is not yet resolved. It can go all the way to the Supreme Court. Let me start with you, Professor Aburao. Yeah, um, on the three issues uh, of secure election, yes, um, the elections uh, have come and gone. Uh, like we mentioned last week, um, the elections uh, haven't been different from the previous ones. In fact, in some instances, we can even say that uh, you know, the conduct was worse than some of the obstacle elections before now. And when the one in, Osh when the one in the Kitty held uh, the other time, there were issues that arose, vote by and the rest of them. In the one in Oshun, this was corrected to a, a large extent. And we're thinking that, you know, INEC could build on that this time to have, you know, a, a, a better election that violence, vote buying, and all the ills that have bedeviled elections in Nigeria, you know, played out again, you know, in the, in the, in the three states where elections held. But we can only hope that uh, moving forward, everybody will learn lessons from uh, the things that transpired and will have a better election uh, in the future. Um, we are always hoping and hoping, but we hope that uh, the, the right things will be done so that the hope will be actualized. Um, INEC, you know, uh, has a key role to play in all of this, and of course, security forces also have a key role to play. We have had instances where vote buying is going on blatantly. Security men are there and they do nothing. Sometimes they even aid, you know, assist in some of the ills that uh, take place because of the elections. So everybody has something to do to make the elections better. And that is, that's something is what everybody must do moving forward for elections to be a lot better. And when elections are free, fair, and credible, the potential for violence at the end of it are minimized. You know, there's an, a, a relationship between free and fair elections and less violence in the aftermath. Um, and then for uh, Paike class book, yeah, we, we, you know, a whole lot of things were said about it about two months or so ago, and uh, I follow through. Um, the, the, the contents are actually brutally frank. And many of the things uh, we never knew to, that took place, these political players and all, um, he revealed a whole lot you know, in that book. Um, Jonathan, Abbasan Jaw, and you know, the book could be a, a good source book for historians, uh, public affairs analysts, and all. Um, and you know, the language I, I read through, the, the parts I, I was able to read through, uh, the language is elegant, well presented, you know, clear prose. Um, so, I mean, I, I commend Paike Clark for documenting his experiences uh, over the years, and uh, there's a whole lot that we uh, have to learn from his life. You know, sometimes they say that if you write a good, good book, you can immortalize yourself, you know. And I think uh, Paike Clark will remember for a long, long time for the contents of this book. Then finally, inflation, yeah, 27.33%. 20, I personally think that that figure is not correct. Uh, Dr. Abadi, tell me one item that you know of whose price has not doubled 
tripled and quadrupled. The price of pepper soup. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's so, what I can compare. So the about three percent is just uh, scratching the surface. I'm sure it's up to fifty percent, um, and that is something that government needs to pay attention to. Um, you know, government has taken measures that will likely, you know, uh, uh, generate wealth. But the government has a weakness, which I've consistently emphasized. The government is not frugal. In fact, I can say the government is prodigal. It's only prodigality you can, is the term you can use to describe a government in this kind of condition, where individuals can get cars of 150 million. Prodigality, there's no other way to describe it. And that is one of the weaknesses of this government. And that's what we urge government to pay attention to. That as you are generating uh, you know, uh, income from all the policies that are put in place, what we gain should be managed in a manner that everybody benefits, not just a tiny few. Right now, a tiny few are the ones benefiting from the gains of the measures that the government is taking. It's a weakness I think the government needs to pay attention to. Let me just make an addendum to this. Uh, in the course of the week, it was mentioned that uh, the 40% uh, income generated by universities that the government said they would take. The government has now said that they won't do that again. I commend the president tremendously for that. But the, the university will have had to grind to a halt if that had taken place. Because, I mean, uh, what they earn is not, is not nearly enough. Government is not giving is practically too small. For instance, Unila gets about maybe 250, 300 million. He pays for electricity 160 million a month. So what the, what the guess on government means that cannot even pay for electricity in two months. Where would the other money come from? It's from IGR. And if government takes the IGR, how does the school function? So I commend the government for that. And uh, I praise you know, the president for that. And I would also urge him that the way he listened on this matter of 40% uh, deduction from you know, uh, the IGR universities, he should do the same for the other things, especially being frugal in the management of the resources of government. Well, it's good to introduce that subject about uh, the federal government reversing itself so. on the plan to deduct 40% of IGR from universities. It's one of the uh, topics we had uh, on the list. And uh, the president says, in fact, under his watch, you ASU members will not have to embark on strike again because he will engage in dialogue, he will promote understanding and collaboration. We praise okay. that. We, we welcome that. So, we don't want strike also. <laughs> but we have to meet each other, meet halfway. So, Professor Awurawo, no, your reward no. is on the way. Well, well <laughs> let's hope so. But it can't be decreed. It can only be negotiated. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think it's a good move. I think it's a good move that the president is you know, coming up by himself to say um, there will be no more strike. And then I will act to make sure there's a no more strike. It, it's, um, it's, it's a hope. And it's also a commitment which signals that somebody is sensitive to not the plight of lecturers, but to the issue of education in the country. Let's, let's look at it that way. As for, um, you know, the inflation, yeah, that's a very serious thing. Uh, listeners might think that Rosaworo is being tough when he called um, the government being prodigal about the way they're spending money. There's a better word for it, which has been rascality. As a matter of fact, worse than prodigality, which because you know it just doesn't make sense. They just don't. They just don't seem to be responsible people. That at a time like this, they're spending as if nothing has happened. That is not just um, an economic issue; it's also a moral and symbolic issue that they need to look at. But this inflation thing, I think, what would help us now is if a group of people led by the Minister of Economy or those who advise them actually get together and say. We need to do five, six things to curb this trend because this is something that devastates the state. The quest for driving investment, especially um, FDI, foreign direct investment, is a very good one. That, that's a good start. That's one thing that they should, keep conti they should continue doing. But I think they should also look at some fiscal policies. Actually, let me say something that I am the school of thought that inflation don't look at monetary policies in a country like Nigeria because our issue is not monetary policy, it's a fiscal issue. Our problem is that demand exceeds supply. So what we need to do is to look for ways to make sure that we vamp up our supply to meet the demand, not reduce the demand. You don't need to rationalize. Equilibrium. Yes, equilibrium, just, just to find more. So, for example, we need to find a way to make sure that um, um, the, 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 we move in the way 
to do things that will allow us to increase that supply. And then, for example, part of what can be done is this. It's actually something that can be done on paper. This idea of government owing government and paying government, like universities paying so much, I think government can step in to subsidize that without writing extra amount. You know, just to look at it and say, because this entity, this is what they do, there should be a special tariff that reduces it drastically and money will stop moving on. Another thing that can be done very quickly is to augment credit facilities rather than, you know, play of interest rate to make sure that the credit facilities are channeled towards productive things, especially if it's made in Nigeria. So th those kind of measures. And of course, we also need to look at privatizing um, some projects and then perhaps even some assets as well. Th those are things that the government needs to, to look at in terms of the economy. Um, one of the other issues was um, Pat Clark's book. You know, I, well, you, one cannot but you know, congratulate him and hope for one to reach, maybe, maybe not even up to 96, nowhere near that. You know, 96 is, is you know, something that you look like, yes, yeah, a very lucky man and you know, a full life. And um, his book is going to be a very interesting read because he's 96. Nigeria itself is, what's Nigeria, 66 or so? And um, so, so he knows Nigeria. That is enough to want to read his book. Unlike other old men, he not only knows Nigeria, he was part of those who made Nigeria what it is today. And therein lies something we need to look at since the book is called Brutally Frank. Let's be brutally frank. Like most Nigerian elites, they are part of what we are today. They are the origin, the cause, the factors of where Nigeria is today. So a lot of people pontificate after you know, they've caused trouble. And I want to brutally frank to Pat David Clark with all respect that he's one of those people. He's one of the story of the Nigerian elite of great individual and miserable collectives. Because individually they all do well, their children do well, their family do well, they are fine, then the whole country is in a mess. And, and I think before people go away to meet their ancestors, it is time we start saying these people while they are something of this nature to people while they are alive so that people can start thinking of their legacy while they're in action, not later on. Because while the book, you, you point out, I think it was chapter 20 or 21, when you talk about what people said about him, you know, the real story of, the, um, of a lot of disagreement and falling out or how the government of Jonathan was with mismanaged of the mentality of this is our son. I think those stories, for those who follow Nigerian issues, they, they, they should be noted out. To the elections, one of the things that hurt me in this country is the idea that we make elections something extraordinary. It shouldn't be so. I really want to beg our viewers that we need to develop mentality that election is about a few people trying to get a job. That is all. We should just look at it at people going for interview and the voters are the panel of interview who's going to decide for them. They're not messiahs. There is no way that one election has changed people's life. We should stop thinking about it that, oh, if these people win, that's going to... No, it's not. It's just a few ambitious people who want to get positions, and the rest of us should be able to get on with our lives. Unfortunately for Nigeria, when we talk about elections, we talk about violence, we talk about vote buying, we talk about rigging. This is a very shameful, embarrassing thing for some of us to have to interface with the rest of the world. Because it doesn't look well. And I've said this elsewhere, let me repeat here, that if we really want to solve this problem, we just need to admit that the people trying to rule Nigeria, the politicians, many of them are crooks, criminals, and non-straightforward people. Because the problem of rigging, the problem of manipulation, the problem of violence, vote buying, is not something that was caused by nature. It's not something that happened accidentally. It is something that a few people or some people get together, conceive, deliberate, mobilize, and supervise. So these people, we, they're human beings that are doing evil to the rest of us. And I think we need to start saying that way. You ask the um, Yiga man if people listen to their recommendation. I think, you know, and he said, well, they listen, they're not listening enough. Guess what? Observers too are doing, but they're not doing enough in Nigeria. Because the truth of the matter is that their observation is not incisive enough. Sometimes it comes late. Sometimes the language is not straightforward. That will not help us. You know, but if people just listen and person and not really deal with it, it's not helping the situation. What we really need is clear-cut language, maybe like the book of Clark. Brutally frank on matters. Let people know that there are rogues, a criminal. And Einek, poor dear Einek, nothing personal. 
annex of today as it stands is improving gradually, but it's not up to the, to the task yet. This INEC as it stands, we need to look at ourselves, not in person and nothing to be ashamed of. If we want to improve it, we need to look at ourselves and tell ourselves that INEC lacks the gravitas, lacks the capacity to inspire transparency and reliability and capability to conduct election. Well, the whole objective of the Electoral Act 2022 yes. was to expand the independence of INEC to deepen transparency and accountability but one of the lessons we seem to have learned from the 2023 process is that Nigerians still have to do more. And that the National Assembly still has to take a second look at the Electoral Act and also at the Constitution. And perhaps also as an obligation to return to some of the recommendations by the Ways Commission, the Ways Committee. The Ways Committee recommended, for example, that the President of Nigeria should not be the person to appoint the chairman of INEC, that the president of Nigeria being a player and again. an interested party cannot appoint umpires and that there must be a neutral forum. The U.S. Commission recommended that the National Judicial Commission should be the one to do that. We can look at the details, okay? And Nigerians have also been complaining about the underrepresentation of women in politics. Is there something that the National Assembly of Nigeria can do about affirmative action? The National Agenda Policy recommends 35%. Nigerian women, under the auspices of the Nigerian Women Trust Fund, went to court, and the Federal High Court of Abuja ruled in their favor April 2022, but the Ministry of Justice went on appeal on the matter. So can you imagine? the Federal Ministry of Justice, arguing against the empowerment of, of Nigerian women. So these are some of the issues that we still have to look at forward, uh, going forward, apart from issues relating to uh, electoral process, ele 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 uh, electronic transmission oh, of results, Section 47, Section 50 of the Electoral Act, the rights of uh, disabled persons also in that act, Section 285, of the 1999 Constitution, Section 134 of the 1999 Constitution, Section 131 of the 1999 Constitution, and so on and so forth. So there are unresolved matters that Nigeria will still have to deal with. But let's go to Liberia. Liberian President George Ware has called his challenger in the presidential race, Joseph Wakai, to congratulate him on his victory. In an address to the nation, Ware said, the Liberian people have spoken and we have heard their voice. The opposition candidate holds an unassailable lead of 28,000 votes, with nearly all ballots counted. A former football star, President Ware, has been in power since 2018. He will step down in January. He came into the job on the wave of enthusiasm, especially from younger voters, having won that election. Also, against Mr. Boakai by a large margin. But the perception that he had failed to tackle corruption, rising prices, and continued economic difficulties tarnished his image. Mr. Ware was magnanimous in defeat, beginning his five-minute address by saying he had the utmost respect for the democratic process that has defined our nation, adding that he has spoken to Mr. Boakai, who he called the president-elect. Again, I come back to you, uh, Professor Aurao. Hmm. That is uh, very interesting. In fact, I would say it is fascinating. It is exhilarating. <laughs> yes, that um, uh, you know, a new dawn is, is being uh, witnessed in Africa. Um, until very recently, we didn't see anything like this anywhere in Africa. Uh, what we saw was uh, incumbents uh, losing the election and then uh, you, know, they, you know letting the hair loose and violence and destruction and everything turning topsy turvy. Um, President Jonathan did this uh, a few years ago, that was in 2015, and it was celebrated, it was acknowledged, it was praised across the world, and now we are seeing others falling on uh, that same routine. It is gratifying because uh, when things like this don't happen. The consequences are always sometimes cataclysmic. Uh, you see violence everywhere in the country, uh, you know, arrested developments, you know, coming out of it and all. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, with this kind of thing happening that incumbent losing election, calling to congratulate the opposition who has now won election, uh, it's, a new, it's a new direction. And we know how this, these things happen. Uh, some domino effects. We will say it happened in Nigeria the other time. It has also happened in Liberia. And what Ghana. can it not happen in Cote d'Ivoire? What can it not happen in, you know, it goes on and on like that. That is why uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy uh, that George uh, Weah has done what he has done. Well, he has had his time. Um, the youths rallied around him, you know, uh, supported him. Uh, and, uh, you know, after uh, these years in government, uh, people felt dissatisfied. They wanted to go in a different direction. It is interesting that Buakai is a lot older than Weah. Yeah. The same youths who brought in Weah have voted him out and are bringing in an older person. So it is not. Yes. Yeah. So it is not how uh, old or how young, really. It's perform people are looking for. Yeah. Who will perform? Mm. And so like, our prayer is also that Buakai should not disappoint those who have voted him, in, you know, to power. But congratulations to Buakai. Congratulations to Liberia. Congratulations to Africa. Well, the man they call Sleepy Joe. He's now <laughs> the elected president <laughs> of Liberia, oh, yeah, yeah. Professor Killer. <laughs> no, I think, you know, I think it's a good thing that we have this kind of smooth process going on, you know. We wish for this kind of, well, good news. The good news is not that Judge Wai is defeated because I'm not sure his family is considering the good news. The good news is that the process is smooth and, you know, there's no trouble there. And that is what we, we hope that spreads, you know. But my, my late papa used to say, it is easier for bad things to spread than for, good, than for good things to spread. And I think we should hope that good things should spread in this way. But one thing we can do as a people, as a community across the world, and as institutions, and as Africans, is to help this good thing to spread is that we need to, actually two things, we need to find a way to reduce the privileges of office so that people do not want to stay there forever. We also need to collectively find a way to find a life for people outside office so that they do not feel that they should stay there forever. George Ware is a good example because I want people to go and read the life of George Ware. You know, this illiterate boy who started by just playing football, then went to study hard, you know, to get his O levels, his A levels, he got a degree, polished himself, understood politics, became president. You know, really, what's that thing to call? I'm from grass to grace story. Very disciplined, physically and mentally as a person. I think he still has a lot to offer the society at large, starting from Liberia and indeed the rest of Africa. I think part of the problem that people have in Africa, why they want to do what Professor Wera was saying before they want to stay forever on their seat and they scatter the table if they lose, is because they get so much while on their seat and after that, there is no life after. But largely because they had no life before they got into that office, because most of them were nobodies. Let's, let's, let's be frank about it. Most politicians in Africa, before they become his excellence, his honorable, they were nobody. They, they had no influence in the society. They had no talent. They had no skill, at least in part to talent and still. So after office, they are afraid to go and face normal life. That is why they want to stay there. I think we need to help them as a people to give them a life after office. You know, brush up on skill. I don't know if they want to talk, teach, or write, or, or do anything. But just to give them a life after so they don't have to stay there forever. So congratulations to Liberia and, you know, they, they, um, Judge Weir has helped them um, get a star in, in history. And um, let, let's hope that continues. If the, the, you know, it's good to wish well the new president, Sleepy Joe, as Ruben Abate wickedly calls him, if, um, if, he, if he does well, he gets re-elected. If he doesn't do well, they sack him. It's as simple no, as that. The point about Sleepy Joe is that he's an <laughs> Adaliba. He's yes. 78. He's going to be 79 very soon. Yes. But the truth of the matter is that he's considered a very steady pair of hands. He is, actually. Scandal-free. Yes. Very humble. I was going to say that. His Star life. Yeah. His Star life is started, a very... Yes. Started as a school janitor. Yes. And rose to the very top. Yes. He was vice president yes. for 12 years. Yes. He was minister of agriculture. And more importantly, his mission, he says, Joseph Bokai. In fact, he once sat in that chair yes. on which you are sitting, no, Professor Aura, in this very studio, you know, is that he wants to unite the country. If anything, the elections have shown that it Liberia is divided. Yeah. Yes. The oldest republic in Africa, yeah. a country founded in 1822 yes. by free slaves uh, from the, the United US, States. Yeah. Another country is at a turning point. It has to do with the challenges of poverty, challenges of unemployment, 
and the grievances of the people. And corruption. And corruption, you know, uh, which is a major minus, uh, they allege, for President uh, Weir. But President Weir has not given up. No. He says he's looking forward to the next round of elections. So he's not giving up, and he has told his supporters that it is not over yet. But let's just take one more topic, and this is something you are interested in, uh, Professor Killer. Yes. Fontana Health Card. Uh, that is also going to be unveiled, like uh, uh, Clark's. Clark's, uh book. Are you a director On the, of the company? Because well, yes. I've been seeing you all you over the my place name all over the talking <laughs> about it. Yes, Tell us the, about it. Yes, um, Fontana Card is um, it's the first kind of card we have in Nigeria. It's an emergency health card. The idea being that um, if something happens to us, which we pray it doesn't, but if it does happen to us, our loved ones... Not in the bedroom. Not <laughs> <laughs> anywhere, <laughs> Dr. Adachi. It happens to us anywhere. The only thing we should be thinking of is if um, an accident happens to us, we should only be thinking of um, blood and pain, not money. Holders of this card, if something happens, will not have to pay anything because they're subscribed to this card. And um, the, the payment will be done um, by their card providers, which is Fontana. And, and, and that's the idea. So that when there is trouble, the, the situation in Nigeria now, when, when people tell you, it took me a while to get used to it, when people tell you, hello, we're in hospital, you don't just have to wish them well. It is actually money they need from you. It took me a while to get that what was going on. But you know, now we've gotten it, and we hope that with this kind of system, it will help our people. The good thing about the card is that the card holder, of course, is a beneficiary, but the card, holder, the card can also be transferred to some other people who yeah, are using it. <clears throat> Look, okay, talking seriously now, yes. I don't want to call Abdul Moiz to send you an invoice. No. <laughs> Nigeria already has what they, what they call an NHIS system. Yes. So is this a comment on the failure of the NHIS system? Well, no, clearly the NHIS system is not a stellar system. I mean, no country... Um, in the world, in their same mind, will, will come and use the NHIS as a model to build their own. You know, we, we need to be frank about that. But beyond that, here's the problem. This is not a routine card. This is not your health card. This is strictly an emergency card. The, this card, if you want compliments, you can have that and still have this. What this one does is two things. Um, number one is that it, in case of emergency, this will cover it. It will cover your treatment. It will cover medication. It will cover all tests. The other thing is that it allows you not to just to cover yourself, but it covers people of your choice. So, for example, you know, whilst one would be willing, if one's wife or mother is sick, why one would be willing to dip your hand into your savings and maybe take a loan, you might not want to do that for, you know, one extended okay, relationship. Maybe after the program, this card will help it. Maybe after the program, you give Professor Awura more information. I will give him. <laughs> he will this, question uh, it. <laughs> now, now that they have increased the salaries of university teachers, he can buy for uh, a lot of people. And uh, President Tinubu has said, you guys will not, not have any reason again. to go on strike again. Uh, <laughs> Prof, you, have you heard it? Your reward is now is that guy or not? Rhetoric. <laughs> By what percentage have salaries increased? Mm. <laughs> we're, we're just taking the pattern that is coming and uh, hoping that more no, will No, probably great to be happy. President Tinubu says no. your reward is now here. Yeah, there will be no more strike. He has the said president it. Prepared. Let us not wait for him to do it. <laughs> the president has anyway, spoken. On that note, thank you very much, Professor Urao. Thank you, Professor Anthony Kila. You've been watching The Zedai, the Sunday talk show. Here on Arise News, I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now. And thank you very much for watching.